We talked about how life sort of moves on parallel tracks. One is the upper story, and that's God's plans and provisions. And the other one is lower level, lower story. It's where you and I live. It's, it's the pain of the bills. It's relating to our family. It is the, it, it's the dealing with the, the job and the employer and the employees. It's everyday kind of stuff. Sometimes we live in the stuff down here so much that we lose sight of upper story perspective. Life is best experienced when we live lower story in the reality and the promise of upper story. And so that's what we've been trying to do over these last four, now five weeks. God has this grand plan to get us back. And he will go to great lengths to have a relationship with us. In chapter 5 of the story, God wants to come down and he wants to live with his people, his chosen family, now known as the nation of Israel. And this is the big idea. That is the big vision of the entire story of God, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. The Trinity of God wants to extend their community to include every one of us who are created in his image. God wants to come down and hang with you and with me. The original vision in Genesis chapter 1. And this is what God is desperately wanting to do in page after page of the scripture. In chapter after chapter of the story, God wants to get us back. In chapter 1, sin changed everything. It separated us from God. It ruined God's vision, and he could no longer come in the cool of the evening in the Garden of Eden and hang with Adam and Eve. Why? Because their sinfulness was repulsive to his holiness. And his holiness was intimidating to their and our sinfulness. In chapters 2, 3, and 4, God interacts with his people and means and methods of bringing us back in a relationship with him. Now in chapter 5, God is determined through a long-term plan to come back and dwell with his people. In order for that to happen, at least three things need to transpire. Number one, we must learn how to treat each other and how to treat God. For that was damaged in the fall of man with the sin in the Garden of Eden. It's obvious. Let's just reflect for a moment. When God showed up in the cool of the evening, just like he had always done, what were Adam and Eve doing? They were hiding. They had never treated God that way before. As soon as sin entered their heart, they went hiding from God. Have you ever hid from God? Ever thought you were hiding from God? They thought they were. Now, that's, that's the relationship between man and God. What about the relationship now? Here's the deal. you got just two people. you think two people could just get along with <laughs> What did Adam and Eve do right away to each other? They blamed each other. Okay? His fault, her fault, snake's fault. Blame. Right away. That probably never happens around your home. <laughs> so first off, we must learn how to treat each other and God. That's the Ten Commandments coming into play. Number two, God now needs a place to hang out with his people. Before Adam and Eve sinned, he could hang out in the garden with them. Now he has a chosen family. Remember, with, with Moses, he hung out at a bush. Okay? Uh, but, but, but the people now, it's a big nation. God wants a place to hang with them. And so he needs a place. It can't be their hearts. Their heart's too sinful yet. They're, they're going to start offering sacrifices of <coughs> bulls and goats and sheep. But that only provides atonement for their sin, not redemption from their sin. And later we'll talk about the real difference between the two. Ah, let's just do it now. <laughs> Atonement is a covering. Atonement is a covering. That's the reason the high priest had to go 
once a year into the Holy of Holies every year and offer a sacrifice is it covered the sins of the people for one year. It was an interest payment on their sin. It didn't pay off the balance. Okay? What happens when you only pay the interest? The debt follows you year after year after year after year. And that was what the sin of Israel was doing with them, with atonement. When Jesus comes to be the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world, now the debt is paid. It is finished. The balance is paid in full. The sin is not covered. The sin is now gone. Big difference between atonement and redemption. But God needs a place to stay. He can't stay in our hearts because it's not redeemed. So that's where the tabernacle comes into play in the people of Israel. And then sin must be atoned for, and that's where the sacrificial <laughs> rites are laid out for the people. How they will sacrifice until the sacrifice once and for all comes to take away the sin of the world. Back in January, early part of January, when, um, when I was in Taft bird hunting, I was with my 70-year-old Uncle Joe. We were uh, in my explore, four-wheel drive. We were up in some pretty remote <coughs> areas in the foothills. Very few people go. We got back there, and of course, last winter, lots of rain. Several of the old roads that we used to go on had been washed out. Thank goodness, one of the roads got repaired. I came in with a big bulldozer and worked things over so that we could get through. Otherwise, there was too big a, too big a gully to get across, and we could not go in places that we liked to go. In January, we did a little exploring into a region we had not been in before, and we come to a place that there is a bit of a washout. And we paused, got out of the car, went and looked at it. Both of us agreed, I can make this. I can do this. And so we got back in, and we took off. I don't think I've told you the story yet. <laughs> and so we, we and guess what? We didn't make it. <laughs> we got to the point I had one, to my right rear tire was completely off the ground, all right? And uh, that, that wasn't a good thing. The other three were not able to pull me out of there at that moment. So we get out and we look at it, and uh, we're thinking, how are we going to do this? We've always said we need to carry a shovel with us for moments like this, and never once in 30 years have we carried a shovel. <laughs> but it's a good conversation. <laughs> And, and, and so I get down on my hands and knees and I begin to move dirt and I begin to put in some rocks and find some sticks and get, somehow find a way that we can get some traction on this fourth tire. I jump back in the car, start it up, get the gas, uh, get nowhere, a little more digging, a little more rock, a little more wood. We are stuck. Now we're trying to figure out how do we call somebody and explain to them where we are? Okay, because we're in the backside of nowhere, all right? And uh, how do we explain? Because we're not quite sure how we got where we were, all right? We knew how to get out, but to tell somebody else how to find us, and we're trying to figure this out. And I sit down, and I say, I'm going to try this one more time. And as I start the car up, I look at my dashboard, and I realize, yes, I am in four-wheel drive, but I am in four-wheel drive high. I reached up and I pushed the button that says four-wheel drive low. I gave it to gas, those three tires bit, pulled us right on out of there. We went from stuck and worried to <laughs> unstuck and ready to hunt in just a matter of seconds. It was amazing. As I thought about that this past week, I thought about where we left Israel last week. Israel had left Egypt as a result of the 10th plague. And they were now free to go to the promised land. God's going to take them on a bit of a journey. And even though they're free, just like my Uncle Joe and I were free on the backside of town, we were free to go anywhere we wanted to go, anytime we wanted to go, to do anything we wanted to do back there. But we needed to get unstuck first. We were free, but stuck. And that's where Israel was. They were free from the country of Egypt, but they were still stuck with Egypt in them. If you'll open your Bible to your map, let's just do a little map work here real quick. 
you'll recall, Joseph and his family had been up by Jerusalem. When Joseph was sold to slavery. The family joined him. They came this route, and they came into Egypt, in this area in here. All right? Now, Pharaoh has let them go, and they're going back to the promised land. Did you wonder while you were reading chapter 5? By the way, how many of you read chapter 5? Read it. Oh, you guys are blowing my socks off. That's almost as many as last week. I mean, you're not, you're staying in there. That's good. But did you wonder, how come they just didn't go straight back? Why did they cross? They didn't cross the Red Sea coming to Egypt. Why did they go south and cross the Red Sea to go back north? I don't know about you, but when I travel, it drives me nuts when I have to go the opposite direction of the way I want to go to get where I'm going. And the worst place for that is Sacramento. <laughs> Obviously, a town laid out by politicians. Okay? <laughs> you want to go, well, understand, when I want to get right there, I mean, no farther than that other building right across our beautiful pavilion. <laughs> but no farther than that. No farther than that. I have had to go the opposite direction, go way around just to get right there. But that was Israel here. They had to go south, go down before they could go up. Maybe God's at work here with another principle as well, because all of us need to go down in humility before we go up. Also, I think it would have been really hard to have drowned the Egyptian army in the desert without the Red Sea. Okay, so there's a lot of other things that are at work there, but anyway, that's kind of a, a picture of where we are. But Israel, stuck in their old ways, with their old attitudes experiencing their old emotions. That's why they're grumbling and whining and complaining. Can we go back? We'd rather be slaves and be out here in the desert. <laughs> Just like the kids on vacation. I'll be there yet. <laughs> you see, God had gotten them out of Egypt, but now he needs to get Egypt out of them. Two million people free from oppression, but they're also now free to suffer, to fail, to be stuck in their old ways, their old habits, their old relationships, their old patterns. In Egypt, they grew from a nation. Remember this, folks. When Joseph brought his family to Egypt, there was only 70 people in the entire nation of Israel. Pharaoh complained that those Israelites, they breed like rabbits. And in 430 years, they've gone to over 2 million, and some say it's more like 4 to 5 million people. From 70 to four plus million people, and they have no kind of government system. They are in a foreign land. And they, they don't have any of this yet. None of this has been written yet. None of this has been given to them yet. They just know they are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they live in Egypt. They have nothing else. So that brings us to the scriptures in Exodus chapter 19 or in the story Bible to chapter 5 and that's page 59 if you want to turn there in the story Bible. Up until now we have studied creation, fall, flood and everything that happened in order to start this nation with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We've studied how Israel got established as a growing nation and now Moses is going to be the first public leader of the nation. He goes from being a son-in-law tending sheep to a leader of a great nation. By God's grace and power, he delivers Israel from Egypt's clutches through the Passover. And then the entire Exodus event occurs. Now we are in Exodus chapter 19. We are moving from ten plagues to ten commandments. To old ways, to a new covenant. To lawlessness, to new laws. They're going to be given at Mount Sinai. And in chapter 5 of the story, it's going to cover the next couple of books of the Bible. The Levitical laws, the events surrounding Sinai, the journey finally to the plains of Moab, up to the eastern side, and then eventually setting up the people to enter into the promised land. But before that happens, Moses is going to preach to them five sermons. That's what the whole book of Deuteronomy is. And if you think my sermons are long, wait till you read those five sermons, man. We cover a lot in chapter 5, just a short chapter of the story, in order to get ready for the next adventure, which is going to be the wilderness wanderings of Israel in next week's chapter. But right now, Moses is leaving the Nile Delta, 
and he's headed to Mount Sinai. It takes two months for them to get there. It is hot, it is dry, it is arid. And you know what the people are doing? Whining. Whining and grumbling all the way. They want water. They want meat. They want manna. He provides for his people through what is frankly a miserable trip for Moses to Mount Sinai. And once they're there, they're going to spend one year of their lives doing something they've never done before as a nation. They are going to get a chance to see the glory and the power and the presence of a God who has rescued them. They see glimpses of him, but now, for a year, God is going to reveal himself in great fullness. They're going to get a good look at an amazing God through a cloud, through fire, through the glory on Moses' face, through a booming voice from the mountaintops. Israel was stuck. Physically free, but spiritually and emotionally stuck. And that was the problem. Free, but without resources, tools, and guidance that they needed to really live the life that God had planned for them. So in Exodus chapter 19 through chapter 40, which is what chapter 5 of the story is all about, beginning at page 59. Turn there if you would. We are going to read from there now. We're going to begin with the second paragraph. Chapter 5, page 59. We read that God tells Moses to tell the people of Israel this message. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. The ten plagues. The crossing of the Red Sea. And how I carried you on eagles' wings. And I brought you to myself. Now if you trust, if you obey me fully, and you keep my covenant, then out of all the nations on earth, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words, Moses, that you are to speak to the Israelites. God says to Moses, tell every one of them, they are my treasured people. God's heart once again saying, I want to spend time with you. This part of Exodus is central to the entire Old Testament story. It is the core of God's character first being revealed to his people. We read here about surrendering our will to God's direction so it reflects his character and his holiness. We understand a bit about worship and what it means to give him the glory that he's due. In this particular chapter, we get a bit of a window into the work of Christ in the future and into the relationship that you and I can begin to have with each other. But here's a question for us this morning. As we looked at the map of the Exodus route, we saw God, people take, we saw God taking people down to Sinai. 430 years of slavery. You thought God would want to get them to the promised land as quickly as possible. To this land flowing with milk and honey that he promised to Abraham. But you see, God knows they need something first. These two million plus men, women, and children need something they don't have. They need to know and understand the presence and the power and the resources and the love and the protection of a God who chose them. For God to fulfill his promises for them to inhabit the land, he needs to prepare them. He needs to equip them. And they need to understand they need to be prepared and they need to be equipped. Remember, they have been slaves. They have had everything given to them or demanded of them and they have not had to choose or think on their own. They've only had to obey. And here's the deal. God wants our obedience, but he wants us to choose to obey him. He never forces us to obey him. The Egyptians wanted the Israelites to obey the Egyptians for their own advantage. God wants our obedience to him for our own advantage. God cares about us, and he wants to spend time with us. So, he brings them to Sinai to give them two important things. <clears throat> he is going to, number one, give to them his love. You will be free. And I will take you there. And 
and I will provide for you. He demonstrates his love. Number two, he's going to give his law, his direction. Let's first talk about the law that he gives. Let me put it in context. You and I don't like laws. We often act negatively towards restrictions and rules and guidelines. We don't want to be told to cross our T's and dot our I's like everybody else. But let's be honest, most of us rebel against rules and people and systems that try to tell us what to do. I'm reminded of the story of a five-year-old girl who was having a very trouble-filled day. She was arguing back and forth with her mother. Finally, the mother had had enough, and she said, Jenny, I want you to sit in the corner right now. Don't get up until I tell you to. Anybody ever tell you that when you were a kid? <laughs> Little Jim went to the corner, she sat down for a few minutes. And she thought about it, and her mother went walking by. She whispered loud enough for her mother to hear, Mom, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> <coughs> I think every one of us in this room has had an I'm standing up on the inside <laughs> nature at one time or another. Every one of us, at one time or another, wants to buck authority, resist the rules. That's why, that's why maybe we have trouble with the Ten Commandments. We view God as this, as this, <coughs> this horrible judge and cosmic killjoy. We think of the Ten Commandments. We think of Charles the Heston coming down the mountain. But today, I hope that we will see the Ten Commandments in an entirely different way. I hope we will see God's guidance behind the law. God is concerned about guiding us more important than governing us. Now there are some weird laws in the Bible. If you read <laughs> Leviticus and Numbers, more than just the Ten Commandments, there are some pretty strange laws in there as we think about them from the 21st century. But that's not all that unusual. We have some weird laws in this country. In various states of this country, there are some weird laws. For example, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, the American version of the promised land. <laughs> if the heaters are on, can we turn them off? Maybe even turn the coolers on to like 74, you know, something in that neighborhood. Because it's really hot up here. Don't turn it low. I don't want to freeze anybody out. Anyway, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's against the law to open a soda bottle without the supervision of a licensed engineer. <laughs> That's worse than Caltrans, also. It's still the law in the books today, all right? In Cleveland, Ohio, it is illegal to catch mice without a hunting license. <laughs> Get this one. I love, I'm trying to visualize this one. It's illegal to drive more than 2,000 sheep down Hollywood Boulevard at one time. <laughs> I would love tomorrow to get 500 sheep and go right down Hollywood Boulevard and say, it's legal, it's legal, it's not 2,000. In Zion, Illinois, it's illegal for anyone to give a lighted cigar to a dog or a cat. <laughs> No, oh, I'm trying to figure out who would waste a good cylindrical object on a dog or a cat. All right? Goofy thing to do. In Carmel, New York, a man cannot go outside while wearing a jacket and a pair of pants that do not match. <laughs> they ought to pass that law in Florida. I've seen the way some of those guys dress on the golf course. All right? In Gary, Indiana, Persons are prohibited from attending a movie house or a theater or riding in a public conveyance within four hours of eating garlic. <laughs> That's not a bad one. I've never been in a small area, all right? Somebody who's had garlic. In Seattle, Washington, in Seattle, Washington, it's illegal to carry a concealed weapon that is over six feet tall. <laughs> six feet concealed? I can't figure that one out. All right, last one. Enough of the foolishness. Finally, in Bexley, Ohio, ordinance number 223, established in 1919, still on the books, 
prohibits the installation and usage of slot machines in outhouses. <laughs> Don't ask me whoever wanted to do that in the first place, but somebody said, we are not going to allow that. I think it's a handle issue, okay? Anyway. <laughs> Some of the Bible laws also appear strange. If you read some of the texts in the Bible, like I said in Leviticus, outside of the story that we're reading now, you come across some things that make you say, what were they thinking? But right here at Mount Sinai, Israel was a new community on their own for the very first time. Human communities are naturally cruel to each other. We hurt, we hurl, we hoard. Do you all remember the lessons from a novel you were probably made to read in high school? Lord of the Flies. <laughs> How long did it take for that community to become destructive? We attack and we withdraw. One guy said, uh, Enough fellow the other day, hey, I heard you and your wife had a really big fight last night. <laughs> yeah, we did. Well, how'd it turn out? Well, she came to me crawling on her hands and knees. Yeah, I heard that one. What does that mean? She came to me on her hands and knees and said, get out from underneath that bed and fight like a man. <laughs> See, because of our sin nature, we need guidance on how to relate to each other. One of the reasons that God gave the Ten Commandments was to help us with the two major problems when sin occurred in the garden. How do we relate to God? How do we relate to each other? He wanted us to stop hiding from Him. He wanted us to stop hurting each other. Well, there are primarily three major kinds of law in the Old Testament. 613 laws can be kind of divided into three main categories, and I'm excluding the dietary laws in this discussion. That's another whole, that, that, that's another set of laws, all right? But three primary parts. First, there's the moral law. If you look, you'll see there are three divisions. This is foundational to all law. This is the heart of the law. These are the timeless truths that never change. It's a moral law, thou shalt not lie. Why will that law never change? Because you see, the Ten Commandments reveal to us the nature of God. God is not a liar. Never has been, never will be. That law never, ever changes. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not commit adultery. God never has been an adulterer. He never will be an adulterer. This is about the character and nature of God. Thou shalt not covet. God never has wanted something that he didn't already have. God never will want something that he doesn't already have. God does not covet. The scripture says God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He does not change. That is the reason the moral law doesn't change. Second of all, we'll find it here, ceremonial law. These are directions associated with the keeping of religious traditions, patterns, and customs. And many were given to Israel. And they were a foretelling of the Jesus to come. And much of that changed after the, the Gospels. And the third, there's this kind of social or civil law. And that's a large portion of the law of Leviticus. It's focused on relationships and how people deal with each other and problems in courts and crime. So those are the three major divisions, moral, ceremonial, and civil. We're going to be looking at the Ten Commandments, which is the moral law. Most of you know these, so we're going to go through them very quickly. They're divided into two areas. Jesus said the whole law was about loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, and then the second one was love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus himself divides the Ten Commandments into these two categories. And so we are going to do that with the Ten Commandments today. The first four commands on page 61 of the story. If you want to turn there, turn to page 61. And let's see here. It's just, um, I think, the bottom half of the page. Yes, it starts on the bottom half of the page. I am the Lord your God. The first four commands 
deal with our relationship with God. One, you shall have no other gods before me. Putting God at the center of the priority of our lives is absolutely essential. And by the way, if you don't do that, forget the other nine. Okay? This one is in the place of preeminence. All right? Number two, you shall not make for yourself an image and worship it. Now, there's nothing wrong with making images that help people move towards devotion. And we'll see that later as you read about the tabernacle. God actually commands Moses to create an image of a cherubim and put it on the ark. The image is not evil. It's when the image becomes the object of our worship. Best way to illustrate that for us? Right there. That's a cross. That is an image. There is nothing wrong with having that image in the church as long as it does not become the object of our worship. If seeing it draws us into devotion to the one who sacrificed his life there, it's perfectly appropriate. But if that ever becomes the object of our worship, then we are in violation of the second commandment. Number three, <coughs> don't misuse the name of the Lord your God. The old King James said, do not take the name of the Lord God in vain. And most of the time, we have associated that with profanity. That is an application. I will suggest to you, it is not its primary application, though. It's probably going to shock you. Have you ever had anybody come to you about something they were deciding in their life or doing with their life, and they said, you know, God told me. God told me. If you are attributing something you are doing in your life to God and he did not tell you, then that is using the name of God in vain. And I believe that is far more serious than the profanity that we've often associated with this passage. It's ranked, you see, he wrote this to people who, who, who he had a, re a special relationship with. So he's not dealing so much with using my name. Quote, care, be careful when you say God told me. Those of us who've been a pastor for a very long time, we've all experienced a situation where somebody comes and says, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the church. Well, why? God told me. Okay. And then when you say thank you very much, I hope you enjoy God's blessing. And then they look at and I've had this happen. You're not going to try to talk me out of it? Why would I do that? If God told you, I have nothing left to say. Okay? Except don't let the door... No, I'm... <laughs> hey! Hey! You get my... Don't ascribe to God something that God has nothing to do with. Number four. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. God knows that when we worship our work, we often will work at our play and we will play at our worship. God loves us and he cares for us. He's designed patterns of rest and worship. He says, just as I rested with creation, the fourth command is that after six days you should rest. Build a pattern of Sabbath into your life. And, and, and here's why. We live in the lower level. And when it consumes us, we need to pause and try to see things from the upper door. And so the Sabbath, now we refer to it as the first day of the week, a day of worship, not only rest. Why? So that we get a, a northern perspective, an upper story perspective of how we've been living. Now the next six commands on page 62 of the story involve the loving of a neighbor as ourselves. It starts out with the most primary relationship on earth. Honor your father and mother. In the New Testament, this is kind of amplified and clarified a bit more. It begins, first of all, with children, obey your parents, for this is right. And then, the honoring never expires. Obedience has an expiration date on it. My dad is still living. I don't have to obey him anymore. Though usually I do. You better. Because <laughs> <laughs> if I know, he's going to whip both of us. Right? But anyway, but, but, but see, I never, I never, ever am relieved 
of the privilege and responsibility of honoring my dad, no matter how old I get. Honor your father and your mother. Number two, you shall not murder. Okay? In the Hebrew, this word is used, and it means the intentional, premeditated, calculated murder. This is not accidental. This is preconceived, premeditated, grievous murder. Number three, you shall not commit adultery. No fooling around. Okay? This is the broad term. In, in, in the New Testament, we've got two words that often define two different kinds of fooling around. Adultery in the New Testament often refers to the fact, okay, if I'm married, I don't fool around with somebody else who's married. I'm married, I don't fool around with somebody who's single. I'm, that's adultery. There's got to be a married partner involved in that for it to be adultery. New Testament terminology. Fornication is the sexual activity outside of marriage between people who are not married. Okay, so it sort of covers the, the, the beginning and the after. All right? This term out of the Hebrew is the wide banner that covers it all. God is not approved, folks. I want you to understand. God does not say no sex. God created it. It was his idea. If you don't like the way it works, discuss it with him. He's the one who planned it this way. All right? He's not approved. But he said, hey, there'll be problems. When in your relationships with others, you step out of the design that I've created for you, there will, you are at high risk of problems. Sometimes you get grace and you don't always have them, but other times, oh, there will be you. you want to cut down the conflicts? Obey my commands. You shall not steal. Number four. Steal what? Stuff, ideas, a person's dignity. Don't steal from others. Number five, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Misrepresent your neighbor, what they say or what they do. Don't do it. Number six, you shall not covet. Do not turn desire into a way that becomes destructive over things, property, and possessions of others. So God lays out his moral law. It's the centerpiece of all law. It doesn't cover every single little thing. That's why lots of other laws came about, because people didn't understand the heart of God's law, and they always looked for loopholes, and then you need more laws to fill the cracks. Mm -hmm. I want to suggest to you, there are several purposes for God giving this law. Number one, the law was first of all to reveal the holiness of God. When you look at the Ten Commandments, you see the character and the nature of God. This is who God is. Would you expect anything less from God? Would you want an unholy God? I think so. Number two, the law reveals the heart of God. Listen to this theologian by the name of Orson Welles. I didn't know Orson had ever said anything like this. Listen to what he said. Our sense of sin will always be in proportion to the closeness of our relationship with God. When we hang out with God, we not only discover who He is, but we find out something about ourselves as well. G.K. Chesterton, an Englishman in the 1900s, said, If people will not be governed by ten commandments, then they will be governed by ten thousand commandments. Why? Because if you don't have the heart of the law, you've got to make all the little tiny laws that fill in all the cracks. We're like, can we do this? What if we do it this way? Or we need a law for that. That's why, that's why there's 10,000 laws on the books. The law also was given to Israel to give them structure. Remember, this is a toddler nation. A toddler nation. These guys are barely learning how to walk as a group of people together. They need structure. When your son or daughter is two years old, we put a lot of structure around them. We create boundaries. We put up gates in front of the doors in the hallway. We put bumper things all over the place. We put locks and latches over every cabinet. We put lots of structure. Why? So they don't endanger themselves. But as they get a little older, we start to give them a little more freedom. They don't need as many rules, as much structure. When our kids turn 10, we let them ride the bike around the neighborhood. We let them go over to the neighbor's house. We pull back a little bit. 
because they're maturing. Then when your daughter turns 16 and the boy shows up at the door for a day, what's the biblical response? Shotgun. <laughs> I said biblical response. Two shotguns. Get thee behind me, Satan! <laughs> we, we, we continue to give them more and more freedom. Why? Because of their maturity. And so the law was given to an infant nation to protect as well as guide them. The law has also been given to lead us to Jesus Christ. He is our tutor, our instructor. The law points us to the need of redemption. And the law was there also to expose our own sin. Romans 7, 7 says, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. When the law appeared, sin seized the opportunity and it put me to death. We would have known what sin was if it was not for the law. We would not know that we were broken. Jesus looked at the law and sat. And Jesus said the law is wonderful and it is beautiful. In fact, it can be an amazing thing. But Jesus said some people misuse the law. If you look at Mark 7, you'll see a question that was raised about ceremonial hand washing. Uh, the Pharisees were criticizing the disciples about the way they washed their hands. <laughs> Why? Because the Pharisees did not understand the heart of the law. They like to add more and more and more laws to make it burdensome on more and more people. Why? So they could control us. God's not wanting to control us. God is wanting to free us. The less laws, the better. That's why he... Two, I mean ten, and he brought it down to simply two. He